It is a privilege to be able to stand in this pulpit and open God's Word with you this morning. But before we dig into the passage that Pastor Jerry just read for us, I want us to start by thinking about some of the ways that God has wired each one of us. In fact, science can help us to understand some of these things, some of these things that we actually already know from Scripture. For example, that we are complex beings uh, made uniquely in the image of God. And so you've probably heard about a person's IQ, and perhaps you are familiar with that term uh, EQ, somebody's EQ, but I wonder if you've ever heard about a person's CQ. Let me explain. IQ stands for intellectual quotient. And, and typically, we think about somebody's IQ as the measure of how smart someone is. But really, what IQ measures is our, our brain power. So if you think of your brain sort of like a computer, your IQ measures both sort of the hard drive capacity, you know, how much information it can store, but also its processing speed, how, how quickly you can access, in, access that information when you need it. On the other hand, you have this thing called your EQ, and your EQ is a measurement which stands for uh, emotional quotient. It's a measure of your ability to, to understand and handle and to show your emotions. And so if you're a person that has a high EQ, you probably are someone that really works well with other people, and you tend to deal with stress a lot better than, than others do. But there's this third category, this sort of well, uh, less well-known uh, metric that science, uh, scientists now use to refer to our CQ, our curiosity quotient. In fact, one study says that our CQ, that is how curious we tend to be, might actually be as important as our IQ and our EQ as we navigate our, our day-to-day compl- uh, complexity of, the, of our lives. In fact, one of the most famous high IQ individuals, Albert Einstein, is quoted as as saying, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. And so in our our walkthrough of the book of Acts over the last number of weeks, I hope that you have been exercising this curiosity quotient. And if you haven't, today is a great day to start doing that, because as we look at this text that Pastor Jerry read for us just a moment ago, I think there's at least three things that stand out to me from this scripture that are rather curious. You know, they might not all be the most significant parts of the passage, but as we work through this text together, I think you'll agree that something very curious is happening in Acts chapter 8. Now, we're only going to briefly look at the first two of these curiosities. Both are very interesting and very important, but I don't think they need to be our main focus. However, when we get to this third curiosity, I think it's not only interesting, but I I really believe it's the main reason why this story is in our Bibles. And we're going to see together uh, that this question has the most relevance to our lives today, and so it'll be worth the bulk of our time together. So again, we're looking at Acts chapter 8, if you have a Bible with you, or you can grab one, beginning in verse 9, where our our narrator, Luke, is now continuing the story, and the story now focuses on this man named Simon. And Luke tells us that now for some time, a, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in this city and amazed all of the people of Samaria. Now, if you are someone who's read through a little bit of the Bible, you probably recognize that Simon is a fairly common biblical name, and in order for us to distinguish between this Simon and the other Simons of Scripture, history gives this Simon the name 
Simon the sorcerer, or sometimes Simon Magus. And we see that Simon was someone who had been practicing magic in this Samaritan city in which Philip had now come to preach the gospel. And so aren't you a little curious about what kind of magic this this sorcerer was into? Now, whatever it is, the text is telling us that Simon at least had a reputation in town. His his Samaritan neighbors were amazed by what he could do. You'll notice at the end of verse 9 and following, it says that Simon boasted that he was someone great and that all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Now I'm going to guess that most of us have one of two pictures in mind when we think of Simon the sorcerer. You know, we might think of Simon sort of like a modern day illusionist. He's an entertainer. I remember as a kid, I got to go to a magic show put on by the illusionist David Copperfield. Do you remember him? Uh, You might remember him back from the early 80s. He was the the magician who somehow made the Statue of Liberty disappear live on television. You can actually go back and watch this on YouTube. Uh, But otherwise, if if you're not thinking of an entertainer, you might be thinking of someone more like Simon as a distant cousin of Merlin or Gandalf or Dumbledore, right? But, But neither of these two pictures are quite accurate. Because in the first century world, most people believed that your daily life in the natural world was immediately tied to, immediately tied to the powers of the supernatural world. And in fact, many cultures believed that, that magic or, or sorcery was the way that you could manipulate these spiritual forces to bring about certain desired results. So, for example, you probably have heard of the Magi or the wise men. Uh, we, we, we talk about them at Christmas time. These uh, Magi were, were likely astrologers who, who studied the path of the stars, and they did this in order to try to discern the events that were taking place on earth. Now, otherwise, a person might consult someone like Simon the magician and, and want to, uh, to, to meet with him to, to gain some protection over, say, evil spirits or to place a curse on an enemy. Or you might seek out the services of a magician to gain favor with somebody. Or even, in some cases, we see that people would seek out these magicians so that they could catch the eye of an attractive member of the opposite sex. Now, if you're still curious about that topic, I would be happy to point you to some good resources that would help you answer some additional questions. But for our purposes today, let's just simply notice that the people of Samaria held Simon and his supernatural abilities in high regard. (laughs) But that's really just the beginning of our story. Last Sunday, when uh, Pastor Jerry was in the text right before this, he reintroduced us to Philip. And Philip was a follower of Jesus who had come to preach the gospel to these Samaritans. And you'll remember that Philip's arrival in Samaria was partly due to a divine opportunity, but also partly the result of increased persecution against Christians in Jerusalem. So here in our text, we learn a little bit more about the effect that the gospel is now having on this region. Verse 12, But when the Samaritans believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now, the significance of what's happening here, the significance of what's taking place among the Samaritans, it really can't be understated. 
You see, the gospel had now come to Samaria, and lives were now being radically transformed. And we know that's what Jesus does. When newborn believers start to take their first steps of faith, this community, this this whole community, they heard what Philip had to say about Jesus and his kingdom, and they placed their trust in Christ. And this whole community turned away from their empty superstitions and their sinful rebellion against God, and together they turned in faith to Christ, and they trusted in His great name. And they were baptized. Now, there are a lot of baptisms that take place in the book of Acts. As we go through, you'll see individuals being baptized. You'll see whole households being baptized. And here in this context, we see even whole communities who are publicly identifying with Jesus Christ through their baptism. When we think about baptism, though, we we might think that Baptism seems like a fairly safe and normal activity for church people today. But we have to remember that in those days, and even in other parts of the world today, baptism is a dangerous activity. Baptism in the name of Jesus meant that you were publicly professing that you had fully identified with Jesus Christ. Remember, the whole reason why Philip had come to Samaria with the gospel was partly because enemies of the church were trying to, were seeking to kill anyone who professed faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we know that baptism didn't save these Samaritans. It didn't magically wash their sins away or by itself bring them into new life in Jesus Christ. But it did express to this watching world of both their friends and their enemies that they were now trusting in the saving and transforming work of Jesus Christ, their Savior. And what had happened in Jerusalem at Pentecost was now starting to happen in Samaria just as Jesus had promised. And so when news reaches Jerusalem about how the gospel is impacting Samaria, the apostles, they decide to investigate. And Luke tells us there in verse 14 and following that when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. I think that's curious. Just six chapters after the events of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, there appears to be a change in what happens when new believers follow Jesus. So comparing those two two texts, two episodes, faith, check, in both, both situations. Baptism, both situations. Receiving the Holy Spirit, well, something different. So here's that second curious thing that I find in this passage It's the question, why was there a delay between when these Samaritans trusted Christ and were baptized and when they received the Holy Spirit? I mean, did did the Holy Spirit have trouble at the border? Or was there some kind of divine shipping delay that was going on here? Or probably more seriously, what does this mean for Christians today? Should we who trust in Christ today expect to have an experience like that of the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8? Or like the Jerusalem crowd at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Or or really, for that matter, like what we'll see when we get to Acts chapter 10 when the gospel comes to the Gentiles? Again, I think that's curious. And as curious as that question is, by no means is it the main point of this passage. And once again, these things are both interesting and they're important, and yet we can only touch on them briefly this morning. 
Here's what I think. The reason why the Holy Spirit shows up late in Samaria has nothing to do with God's punctuality. It has everything to do with Jesus' promise that was made back in the opening verses of the book of Acts. Maybe you remember from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, Peter and John, two of Jesus' designated witnesses, had come to affirm to both Jews and to Samaritans alike that the gospel had indeed come to Samaria just as Jesus promised. They confirmed that the Holy Spirit had come to bring new life to those who believe. They were bearing witness to what the Lord had said to the apostles about the coming of the Holy Spirit prior to his ascension into heaven. Again from Acts chapter 1, Luke tells us that on one occasion while Jesus was eating with them, that is his disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, these accounts of the Spirit's coming in the earliest days of the church are truly curious. And I think more than curious, it's amazing to imagine what it would have been like to be there, to see, and to hear these things as they happened. As the promised Holy Spirit is now bringing God's people into a brand new era of salvation history. But these outward and visible manifestations of the Spirit in Jerusalem, Samaria, and the Gentile world in Acts, I think were intended to be unique events. And I believe that they're not necessarily something we should expect to see today when an individual comes to faith. And yet, it is important for us to understand from Scripture that if we are in Christ, we too have been baptized in the Spirit. See, when we repent of our sin and we place our faith in Christ, we are united in Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are baptized in the Spirit. And for example, we read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13, where Paul says that just as one body, though, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. I think that's why so often in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, New believers are quickly baptized with water in response to their new faith in Christ. You see, water baptism is an outward, visible expression of what has taken place in the heart of the new believer through that transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit's arrival in Samaria was extraordinarily amazing. But I also hope as we consider these things, that we are no less, amazed, no less amazed by the ordinariness of the baptism in the Spirit that takes place at the moment when a new believer is converted and when they repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes this extraordinarily ordinary, regenerating and unifying work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a new believer. From Titus chapter 3, Paul says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs of 
having the hope of eternal life. Now, I'm sure as we consider these things that some of you have more questions about baptism in the Spirit. There may even be some who hold a different understanding of what's going on in our passage. But again, in the interest of time, we're going to have to take those curious conversations and have those over a cup of coffee, maybe at a later time. But a moment ago, I mentioned this word, conversion. So let's talk about the curious case of Simon the Sorcerer's conversion. I want you to follow along with me as we discover what happens next after the Spirit's arrival in Samaria. Picking it up in verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you, as you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or shame and share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. So what's going on here? In the midst of this great spiritual revival, Simon is focused not on the transformed hearts of his neighbors, but on the powerful hands of the apostles. Remember, Simon is a sorcerer. He's someone who makes his living by offering supernatural services to those who are in need of a spiritual assistance. So imagine what his Samaritan clients might say about this one that they had called the great power of God, if he could also dispense the power of the Holy Spirit at will. You know, that kind of power is priceless, and so he offers to Simon, or he offers to Peter and John a few bucks, maybe for a share of their hands-on apostolic authority. And folks, I think this is the most curious question of the entire passage. Was this Samaritan sorcerer truly converted? I mean, was Simon genuinely saved with his Samaritan brothers and sisters on that day? Or to ask it another way, can we expect to see Simon in heaven? Or was his faith just a hoax? Some of us might wonder if that's even a fair question. I mean, who are we to judge the genuineness of another person's conversion experience? what, What gives us the right to even question the sincerity of somebody else's faith? This is exactly what the Apostle Peter does. Notice Peter's counter offer there in verse 20. Peter issues, first of all, a very strong rebuke. And in the message version of this passage, paraphrases it this way, where Peter responds, to hell with your money, and along with you along with it. Well, that's unthinkable, trying to buy God's gift. You'll never be part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. I don't think Peter is by any means sentencing Simon to hell, but he certainly is warning Simon, telling him that his unrighteous heart is taking him down a hell-bound path that will eventually lead to God's righteous judgment if he maintains this course. And that Simon's only hope is to turn away from sin and to begin to follow Jesus in the other direction. And so Peter calls Simon to turn things around. He says in verse 22, Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now Simon may have been impressed with the name of Jesus. He may have been amazed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But Peter could see that Simon had not yet turned away from his sin and sought forgiveness by trusting in Christ as Savior. 
shows us that faith and repentance are two sides of the same conversion coin. Faith is so much more than believing that something is true. It's actually an act of trust. And so the gospel calls us to faith in Jesus. It's an invitation to trust God's promises that he has made a way of salvation for us through the work of his son at the cross. Faith is is taking God at his word, trusting that he can redeem us, reconcile us, and restore us because of what Christ has done on our behalf. But in order for us to trust in Christ, we need to abandon our trust in whatever it is that holds our heart's allegiance. That word repent literally means to change one's mind. In fact, repentance really is about a change of worship. Who or what does my heart assign worth to? You see, repentance is not just a a new effort to modify or to moderate our bad behavior. I can easily adjust my behavior, but that doesn't mean that I trust Jesus. When the gospel calls me to repent and believe, it calls me to confess that my trust and my worship in anything and everything that is not God has failed me. It's a call to cut off my faith in empty things. It's a call to place my faith in the trustworthiness of God's promises. And for Simon, Christ was not only calling him to leave behind this life of sorcery, But even more so, it was a call to abandon his trust in power and in reputation. And to run empty-handed to Christ in faith. So what happened to Simon? Did he repent? Did he follow Jesus? Or did he go back to this life of sin and sorcery? No, honestly, we don't know. This is really the last we hear of Simon in the book of Acts. Luke doesn't tell us exactly how this story ends. And I think he does this on purpose. I don't think that Luke included this account so that we would sit here and speculate about Simon's place in eternity. I think that Simon's story is meant to act like a mirror. So that each one of us might consider whether or not true repentance has taken place in our own hearts. And so while I hope that you found this account of Simon's so-called conversion interesting, I hope that this text will cause you to become passionately curious about your own conversion. And my desire this morning is not to create doubts in your mind about your genuineness of faith, but rather it's to help us all discern who or what has truly has a hold of our trust. Now, even if you're someone who has walked with Christ for some time, there might even be an area of your life that needs a bit of realignment. And perhaps there's a need for true repentance. And if so, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I confess that I have offered my trust that belongs only to you, to things and to others who are far less worthy. Father, would you forgive me for giving my worship to worthless things? For you alone are worthy. And Holy Spirit, would you continue that good work of transformation in me that you began when I first heard the gospel and I repented of my sins and first believed in Christ my Savior? Father, thank you that you have securely brought me into the body of Christ, and that in Christ no one 
can snatch me out of my Father's hand. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.